Farmland Birds, What Can We Do to Turn Their Fortunes Around? Presented by Peter Thompson, former biodiversity advisor for the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. The landscape of Cranbourne Chase is home to a vast array of birds. In this talk, Peter will talk to us about some of those birds which fascinate him most, how important birds are to the landscape, and how we can work together to create and conserve habitats for the benefit of all. Thanks very much. Um, well, good, um, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome. Um, as uh, has been said, I'm going to give about a 40 minute presentation um, on farmland birds. So I think probably the first thing I ought to do um, is to, to actually talk to you about what farmland birds uh, we're discussing. Um, this is actually something that the government has chosen. They've chosen 19 species of birds so that they can monitor how well they're doing um, over a period of time. Um, and this gives them an index of how farmland birds are, are, are being managed across. This is for the whole country. Um, now, again, you can go online and you can find all sorts of different um, statistics as to whether tree sparrows have gone down by 94% or 90% or 89%. But um, this lot that I've chosen here um, goes back to about 1970. Um, and the key thing really is to, sh to show you that um, those ones at the top uh, really have fared pretty badly. In fact, if you take farmland bird specialists, and those are the ones that are actually dependent on farmland. In other words, they don't use the coast, they don't use heathland, they don't use woodland. Um, they really are dependent on farmland. They've probably done worse than any other set of birds in the country. Um, and I will go on to explain some of the reasons behind that. It's not all doom and gloom. Some species are doing quite well. You can see that um, good old wood pigeons have gone up by 125%. Um, um, and it does fluctuate quite a lot from year to year. So I see the green finch there is down at plus 23, but in fact, they haven't done so well over the last two, three, four years because they've been getting um, some infections from uh, eating perhaps actually at uh, people's bird tables um, and they've been getting trichomosis and that's not done them very very well but they seem to be bouncing back again now but the general thing from this slide I want you to note is that a lot of farmland birds are doing badly so what are the reasons behind that well um, here, here's a few generally it is the intensification of agriculture um, because as I say, these birds are dependent on, on farmland for their survival. So if you go back to when pesticides came out, that's, so I'm including insecticides and fungicides and uh, herbicides, in other words, weed killers, um, they started to really appear in around about the mid 1950s. Um, so that is when uh, the first insecticide, for instance, really came out, there were ones before, but they weren't very widely used. So my statistics showing you what's happened since the 1970s, we perhaps ought to be going back to the 1950s because that's when, you know, after the war, dig for Britain and all of that, when real changes began to happen. Um, there were all sorts of things happening um, across the country since then. We, we've moved, if you like, in not so much in this part of the world, but in certain parts of the country, there's very much uh, farmers have become all arable or they've become all dairy farmers. In other words, they've just got grass, um, but also they have tended to block crop. So in other words, if you go out now, I'll see rapes in flower and you'll see large expansive field after field in, in a lovely yellow color. And then the following year that'll go into wheat. Now, some species love all seed rape and others hate it. So it depends if you happen to have decided your little territory in a hedge and you've got all seed rape next door to you, you might not like that at all. Um, so in the, in the past, it used to be much more mixed. So you had bits of grass, you had various crops, um, and, and each farm would have quite a number of different crops being grown. Um, we've also um, drained the land. It's a lot drier. We tend to spend a lot of money on getting the water off fields, into ditches, into rivers and out to the sea and then wonder why it's very dry come hot, dry summers. So that's something else that uh, is being looked at. Um, and also for a while, I hasten to add, not, not happening now, but for a long time, uh, farmers were actually paid to take hedges out. 
um, and indeed fill ponds in. We used to have about a million horses working on farms um, and those horses need to have a drink. And so every field, every four fields anyway, in the corner where they all join, used to have a pond. And when the, the plowman had his lunch, he'd take the horse across to have a drink. Well, you know, once machinery came, that wasn't needed anymore. So a lot of ponds were filled in. Um, I've also written down increase in predators. And I will briefly mention that later. But uh, in the past, um, if you take our part of the world, ravens, buzzards, um, even sparrowhawks uh, weren't necessarily that common. Um, and also things like carrion crows and magpies and foxes tended to be probably more controlled than they are nowadays. So that may or may not have an impact on certain species, perhaps not on others. Um, and as I say to all students answering any exam to do with the environment, always include climate change uh, because you're bound to score a point uh, in your exam. We don't really know what impact climate change is going to have. It may well benefit some species. And of course, you know, we are getting more species turning up. So we're gaining species um, because they are moving north um, and we're doing quite well. But also it may be that actually we lose some species as well um, due to hot, dry summers or perhaps um, big downpours of rain um, at certain times of the year might drown nests or, or chicks or whatever. So there's a lot of different reasons, and I will go through more about this as I, as I go on through the talk. So what can we do, if I really simplify it down, what can we do for farmland birds? If I go onto a farm and I'm talking to a farmer, um, to keep it simple, the, the real thing to do is to try and provide those birds on your farm with round the year uh, habitat and food. So at this time of year, they're all choosing to nest, um, some nest on the ground, some nest in field margins, some nest in hedges. Um, so try and make sure that you've got good sites for nesting for these birds. And then when they hatch their chicks out, virtually all the farmland birds that I'm talking about um, actually eat, need insects to feed their chicks with. Um, there is one exception and I will pick on this bird particularly at the end of the talk, uh, and that's the turtle dove, which largely feeds on seed. But the others really need um, insect rich habitats to go and find lots of insects to feed their, their young with. And then come the winter, now you've produced your birds, you need to look after them over the winter and indeed into springtime too, um, because a lot of these birds are eating weed seeds or grain. Um, and of course our farms have become an awful lot cleaner than they used to be. Um, so that's another area that I will be uh, including in my talk. So the other thing to say is that obviously each bird varies slightly. Um, and so knowing what you've got on your farm is actually quite an important thing because once you know the species you've got, or at least in the vicinity, then you can start to provide the different habitats for the species that you've actually got. So let's start with, with nesting sites. I'll just give you a little flavor of some of the nesting sites. Here you see a big field. Um, it's got a, a nice hedge, no trees in it. Um, it could have trees in it and that would be fine. Um, but notice that it's also got a nice wide field boundary. So it's not just the hedge, it's got probably a couple of meters, if not more, of tusky grasses and some wildflowers in it. Um, and that's great. Not only does it help protect the hedge, um, and the hedge will be a lot more healthy because we've moved the actual farming out a little bit from the hedge, but also this doesn't, this really does provide great habitat for, for birds. Um, some birds like linnets will go and nest in the hedge. You've got blackbirds and dunnocks and song thrush and species like that will nest there. But an awful lot of the farmland birds that, that we're dealing with will actually nest in the bottom of the hedge in that grassy bit. Um, and one such bird is actually a little migrant um, that's turned up um, in the last uh, three, four weeks. The white throat, here's one singing, see why it's called a white throat. Um, it's got uh, that white throat and they're pretty common and they're actually doing really quite well. They're one of the species that's doing all right. Now, if you just have a hedge, then you won't have white throats nesting. You've got to have that hedge with that little bit of grass next door to it because they nest down in the tusky grasses at the base of the hedge. Now in the past, um, and I originally trained as an agronomist, so for a while I was advising 
farmers on how to farm, and I'm probably as guilty as, <laughs> as any farmer, um, we used to go and spray out hedge bottoms because we thought that's where all the weeds came from. Um, you will know products like um, tumbleweed, glyphosate, Roundup, it's, it's all the same thing. And when that came out, we thought, oh, yippee, we can squirt all these horrible things out of the hedge bottoms. Well, things like white throats really hated that because they absolutely had nowhere to nest. Um, so that is something that's completely changed now. Um, you actually have to leave a little bit of a boundary next door to a hedge. You can't go too, too close. You've got to only go, you can't cultivate more than two meters from the center of the hedge. But farmers are actually also putting um, much wider grass margins in and being paid to do it by, by government because um, this is where a lot of the, the birds nest. I hasten to add also that it's where a lot of the insects that I'm going to be talking about um, actually overwinter too. So if you go and look in these grassy uh, margins, especially if they haven't been cut, they're nice and tussocky, you will find huge numbers of insects overwintering there, along with things like queen bumblebees and, and, and other species like that. So um, that, that is a key thing, a bit of advice for farmers. Then you have a, another, one of my favorite farm birds. Unfortunately, um, we don't have many. Um, across the AMB. There are a few right up in the top of the AMB in the northwestern part, um, but actually in the northern part of Wiltshire, the top half of Wiltshire, they're doing quite well and expanding. So I'm hopeful that over the next, I don't know, five, ten years, we may start to have more tree sparrows turning up, and so we need to be ready for them. So what do they want to nest? Lovely little chocolate um, brown head and the, that giveaway little black dot on the, on the cheek. They're wonderfully neat little birds, and they're quite gregarious, and they nest um, in holes um, and they like to be together. So if you find a suitable, nice, tall, thick hedge um, out on farmland, they, they're not like particularly like our house sparrows. They like to be right out in the countryside, but they if you put up nest boxes, um, then you can get you can get quite a colony. Um, and uh, again, if you have your insect rich habitat nearby, then they will take over these and they can do quite well. So we know what to do for them. Um, uh, which is great. And so where we know we have tree sparrows, we can provide the nesting site and everything else that they need, and we are really increasing numbers. So hopefully they will turn up uh, more abundantly um, before too long with us. Then everybody knows the skylark um, singing away at the moment. Skylarks have not done well, they've dropped 60 odd percent, but I think they are stabilizing a little bit. Um, and actually one of the good things about our area is that we do have quite a lot of spring cropping um, because one of the problems with this bird um, is that when it comes to nest, it doesn't like dense crops. So it won't like oilseed rape. Um, it doesn't even particularly like cereals that are planted in the autumn. It might get one brood off, but then the crop gets too tall. So it likes barer ground, more open ground. And one of the bits of research the RSPB did is to find out that actually if you create a little landing strip for them, um, then actually they will continue to use otherwise unsuitable crops. So they've come up with this thing called a skylark plot. Um, and again, you can get paid to do this um, under the, the, the stewardship scheme. And it's literally where you don't drill a bit, or if you do, you can go and just squirt it out and kill the crop. And what's happening here is the birds are literally using it a bit like, um, you know, coming into an airport. So they land there um, and then they walk into the crop and they'll nest just in, into the crop. Um, one of the designs of this is that we offset it from the tram line. In other words, that's the bit where the tractor trots down. Um, they have, you can see the wheelings in the, in the field that the tractor follows. But the, the predators also follow those wheelings. Um, so you'll get things like stoats and rats and and another thing, other predators running along these, um, these tram lines. So what we do is that we put these skylark plots away from the tram lines so that the predators hopefully trot through the field and don't come across these plots um, where the skylarks are, are nesting nearby. And these have been successful and it means that skylarks can continue to breed and they'll sometimes be four brooded. They will actually take off four broods in a season um, if everything goes well. Um, another one of my favourites, this is a, a bird that's really do not done well, um, the lapwing, um, the, um, uh, it's, it's sometimes called a peewit or a green plover is another name for it, got lots of country names, and at this time of year 
Um, they're out on farmland. They also use marshes and they use our river um, areas too, the, the flood meadows to nest on. But um, what they do is they like to nest on the ground and at the moment they will be displaying, giving their lovely calls, flying around, the males will be flying around. They're quite early nesters. So they'll be nesting from March onwards and the male, if anything flies across like a buzzard or a carrion crow, he'll be up there and he'll be flying around mobbing it, trying to chase it away. So they're great parents. Um, and of course, they have, if you like, a slightly bigger skylark plot. We actually put, there's one out in the distance. Um, and this is a, a plot called a lapwing plot or fallow plot. Um, stone curlews could um, also nest on them. Um, and they tend to be a couple of acres in size, two, two and a half acres in size. And it's cultivated ground because again, this is another bird that likes to be right out in the open, but it likes to see what's happening. So it doesn't like to be surrounded by a crop. So again, birds will use these. Um, and if you can get a few of them using a lapwing plot or you can get a number in an area, then they're quite good at fending off predators. Um, not so much foxes um, or badgers, but certainly the, the corvids, the, the crows and the magpies and things. Now, I mentioned this because um, when I mentioned predation earlier on, I think um, if I was going to pick on a group of birds where predation may well be an issue, and certainly um, some scientific evidence to, to back this up, it's with ground nesting birds. Um, and so here's a lapwing's nest, fairly simple, just placed on the ground. Um, and things like foxes uh, are very good at finding um, nests and indeed chicks once they've hatched. Badgers are less so, but they're still quite likely to bumble across them. Um, and of course, things like carrion crows are very good at sitting in an oak tree and just watching. Um, and if they see a, a hen bird coming on and off in a certain place, they'll just pop down and see if there's a, a nice tasty morsel for it. So in certain places, um, predator control might be necessary. Um, or it might be that if you've got a lapwing plot, you put things like electric fencing around it. Um, and that will certainly help to deter things like badgers um, and foxes. Um, but predation for ground nesting birds um, it is an issue. It's been shown with grey partridge that if you don't control predators, then you're going to get big losses. Um, and so um, that is something that uh, to bear in mind. And certainly some of our nature reserves are doing predator control um, for things like lapwings, um, red shank snipe, um, and other ground nesting birds. So those same lapwings, um, now they've hatched their chicks, um, they want to go off and take their chicks because their chicks can walk very soon after hatching. They will march them off to go and look for some worms and leather jackets and beetles that run around. And what they're looking for is um, unimproved grassland. So again, I go back to the fact that we now tend to have quite a lot of all arable farms or all grassland farms, and we don't perhaps have as many mixed farms. Although, again, I have to say that we are blessed in this part of the world. We still do have quite a lot of mixed farms, which is wonderful. Um, so this bird, the lapwing, likes to nest on the arable, but then it particularly likes to take its chicks to go and forage for, for insects on unimproved grassland. So you can see there that they, they're using the two different habitats. Um, the other, the other birds that I'm discussing tend to go and forage um, where you've got weeds or non-cropped areas, if you like. Um, this picture here, you can see on the left, um, the, the problem, if you like, it's, uh, this is a, a very good crop of barley. Um, and of course, that's good because the farmer needs to be profitable. Um, and so he or she needs to grow that good crop and it needs to yield well and that keeps them in business and keeps us all fed. But around the edge, what they've done is they've just cultivated it and allowed some broadleaf weeds, as we call them, the little annual weeds that come up. So poppies and all sorts of other um, fat hen and chickweed and all these things. And all of these different um, weeds have associated insects with them. Um, and so if you go and look for insects in a little habitat like where these poppies are, you will find heaps and heaps of insects. So the birds that are nesting in this hedge here or indeed out in that crop, um, they could be um, grey partridge nesting in either the hedge or out in the field, could be the skylarks using the plots. 
um, they will come and forage in this field boundary and collect lots of insects and so that their chicks do quite well. It's interesting because when chicks are not particularly well fed, in other words, the parents having to go long distances to find food, those chicks tend to make more noise because they're hungry. Um, and so they're sitting in the nest going, you know, feed me, jeep, jeep, you know, and that's not good because if you make a lot of noise, you're more likely to get discovered by the passing stoat or weasel. Um, uh, so uh, if, if you're well fed and the parents don't have to go very far to find the insects, then the productivity tends to be more successful because the predation drops. Um, farmers are also planting strips of wildflowers. Um, and this is really becoming quite common now. Um, and a lot of people say to me, oh yes, but you know, they've all been farming it and it's very fertile and you can't grow wildflowers. Um, you can grow wildflowers and it's, uh, if you follow the right uh, uh, information, you can get a, a lovely display like this. This is oxide daisies, it's got bits of sandfoin, later on it'll have things like knapweed coming up and scabious. You need to take advice though, if you're a farmer, go back to do this. Um, because being a farmer, you'll probably want to drill it. That's the first thing. And these little tiny wildflower seeds are, are really tiny and they do not want to be buried. So that might be your first mistake. But also you need to try and get flowers that are local to you. So certainly indigenous to this country, but also um, try and source seed that is as, as a local provenance. Um, and then sow it at the right time and choose the species that are correct for the soil type. But if you do all of this, um, you can land up with a lovely display like this. Some farmers like to put this bit of uncropped land before you actually get into the crop itself. Um, one, the, probably the main reason is it stops weeds coming out of the field boundary and encroaching on the crop. But actually it's quite good for birds too. They quite like to come and dust bathe and run around in there and dry out after, after wet periods. Um, but this, again, this, this bit on the left here with the wildflowers, full of insects. Um, and so although the farmer might be putting this in um, for, yes, the insects, it's going to benefit things like um, bumblebees and hoverflies and many of our other pollinators. So this is a sort of real win-win situation. Um, and the field of peas that the farmers are standing in there learning about how to do this, um, because one of the other good things about these schemes is that we know how to implement them now. And so really all we need to do is get farmers to do it and give them the good advice. Um, and there's a huge will by farmers to do these sorts of things. And I'll talk more about that later. So I've been mentioning gray partridge. Um, this is probably the most researched of the farmland birds. This is our indigenous partridge, not the, the red leg, the, the one that you quite often see, um, which is a bit, bit gaudy. Um, this is a very, uh, this is a fantastic bird. They're superb parents. Um, you can see the male there, um, standing by his by his wife, by the missus, who's having a a, a nice little dust bathe in in the uh, they they do love getting down and when it's dry and create quite large holes dust bathing. But he's watching. She's probably come off some eggs and she's just had a little feed, little dust bathe, and then she'll go back um, into that field boundary and sit on her eggs. And he will keep really good watch. So he's a superb parent. Also, when they hatch the chicks out, um, it's one of the birds who. Um, if, if a predator comes along, he will pretend that he's injured. So he will go right up in front of a fox or a weasel or stoat and he'll flop about as though he's got a broken ring. And so the, immediately the stoat thinks, wow, this is going to be an easy meal. So he follows the, the, the male um, partridge away. And meanwhile, the female is quietly taking her chicks in the opposite direction. And then when the when he thinks that uh, the predator is now far enough away from his family, um, he suddenly miraculously recovers and flies off, leaving a rather dumbfounded stoat or, or fox or whatever. So fantastic teamwork, um, a very modern marriage, I think. Um, so we've now looked at um, some of the nest sites. We've looked at some of the ways of, of handing birds plenty of good insect foraging habitat. Um, and now we are getting to the autumn and, and into winter, which can be a very difficult time because, as I say, um, we have become quite tidy in our farming. Um, we needed to be. Um, crops back in the 50s were full 
Um, they were very, very, very weedy. They were full of thistles and docks and, and, and nice plants too. Things like corn marigold and corn cockle and corn flower that we now all go, gosh, isn't it rare? But they used to be hated by the farmers because of course they were fighting the crop for space and for nutrient. And so farmers wanted to try and get rid of all of these because once you've just grown a monoculture of a crop, then it's going to yield well. But that, of course, isn't good for the, for, the, for the birds. So now when we combine, we tend to have very clean stubbles. There aren't the weed seeds there for the farmland birds anymore. Um, and also, I remember as a child walking around farms, as you walk past the, the grain store, there'd be a massive whoosh of birds coming out of the grain store. You know, everything from pigeons and stock doves through to sparrows and corn buntings. Um, you know, they're they were just open to the elements. Whereas now, of course, they've got to be in a sealed grain store um, and nothing is allowed in there at all. So um, it's all really made life pretty difficult for birds over winter. So this farmer here, um, he's combined his field, but he's left a, a strip around the edge uh, of the cereal crop that he's grown. And he probably hasn't bothered to spray it really at all either. So it's pretty weedy in the bottom with weed seeds. Um, and this is, if you like, a long, long linear bird table for the birds to feed on. Uh, and again, this can be funded under stewardship scheme. So that's a, a, a relatively easy one to do. And that can remain right the way through um, into February and March before he then cultivates it and perhaps puts another crop in. So that's what I mean by weedy stubbles. That's how all stubbles used to look, certainly when I was a nipper, uh, which is a very long time ago, and I, I admit. But um, full of, uh, of weeds. And as you can see, uh, once the crop's taken off, many of them will quickly flower and produce seed. Um, and some of these plants, one that springs to mind is a little plant called a fluellin, which is quite common in our part of the world. And really it doesn't grow very much until the, the crop's taken off. And then it really motors, flowers, gets pollinated and produce lots of seed. Um, so these areas here are fantastic for farmland birds. They're also great for many other of our farmland species. So things like brown hare will be found over winter feeding out on here because that, that at the end of the day is a nice mix, field of mixed salad, if you like. Um, so they'll love it out there. Um, and also things like harvest mice that don't hibernate, they need to feed all through the winter. They'll be using a field like this too. But again, farmers are very wary of allowing weeds to, um, to get a hold again, if you like. And it depends which weeds you've got too. They're particularly worried about things like wild oats and black grass, um, but they're perhaps more likely to let some of the less injurious weeds uh, flourish in their crops. Um, so birds like a yellowhammer. Um, this is a fa fabulous little bird, um, not done particularly well, loves mixed farming. In the winter it'll mess about around stock being fed out of doors, um, and uh, they again, everything I've been talking about really fits in with them. They nest right down in the bottom of the hedges where the white throat nests um, and they feed their chicks on insects, but they're very much a, a seed eater come, come the winter. And they really do respond well. Um, you know, where farmers put everything together, you can see some big increases um, in yellowhammer numbers, um, which is fantastic. So we know exactly what to do for them. Um, it's a bird that, uh, has many country names, yellow bunting. Um, it's also called a, sometimes called a scribbling lark. I, I was taught, uh, I used to mess around with, you know, I used to permanently be on farms. My dad wasn't a farmer, but I used to mess about on farms and uh, go around with keepers and things. And there was an old boy, an old keeper, and he used to call them scribbling larks. And I said, well, what, why is it called a scribbling lark? I thought it was called a yellow hammer. And he said, well, son, go and find a nest. And then have a look at the eggs and come back and tell me why it's called a scribbling lark. So it took me quite a while because they're not easy to find. They're well hidden right down in the bottom of, of the thorny bits and the grass at the edge of hedges. But eventually I did find one. Now, when you look at them, it does look as though someone scribbled on their eggs with a pencil. Um, a school child just sort of scribbled all over them. So I came back and, and, and um, told him this and he said, yeah, you, are, you won't forget that now. And here I am all those years later telling you this. Fabulous bird, one of my favorites. Um, the other thing that farmers do is that they actually grow wild bird seed mixtures as they're called. In other words, they're growing crops to feed us, but they will also grow a crop to feed their farmland birds. And this is, if you like, um, intensive agriculture 
Um, if you're going to take out, if I can persuade a farmer to take 3%, 5% of his farm out, get funding for him to do it through a stewardship scheme, I actually want him to manage that area for conservation quite intensively because I want him to not just to chuck in a bit of seed and see what comes. I want him to grow a good crop so that it actually yields well and there's lots and lots of seed for the farm and birds to eat over winter. It's really, really important. So I want him to put fertilizer on this and get it to really yield well. And then it, the joy of walking out into one of these in November and December and seeing massive flocks of birds flying off them um, is very, very rewarding. And farmers now, they, this has been done all over the country, including um, locally. And another bird that um, will spend all winter using these is, is a bird called a linnet. Um, I actually think they're doing, they, they, they've declined, but I actually think they're doing quite well. I do a lot of surveys um, over winter and I think I've probably recorded more linnet this year than I've recorded for a long time. So I actually think that they are not doing too badly. I think they've begun to reverse their decline but they're very dependent on, on seeds over winter. Um, and in fact, although they feed their young uh, in the summer on, on insects, they quickly change to all seed rape seed as it begins to ripen off. And I've actually seen birds coming back into the nest with, with their mouths um, full of all rape seed and their whole head is yellow because <laughs> they've been going in to get it and they, they haven't, um, the flowering isn't quite over yet and they're picking out the, the ripening seed. So they, they're, they're a lovely little bird too. And they, you'll see big flocks of undulating um, birds, tiny little birds, very undulating flight, tweeting away in the winter, rising off these crops, um, and they'll probably be linnet. But we then have this thing called a hungry gap. I'm just checking the time, see how I'm doing. Yeah, we have this hungry gap, um, and that's sort of from Christmas onwards, January, February, March, and even into April. So what we do is we supplement the feeding by actually going and spreading some seed. Um, and this is mixed seed, some grain for the bigger birds, things like corn buntings and partridges, down to little tiny seeds for the, the, for the linnets and the goldfinch and, and species like that. So a nice mixture. And we just chuck it around on the ground um, and they will come and soon find that uh, and start to feed. Um, you'll see a lot of hoppers around. Farmers who run shoots will fill these hoppers up um, with, with wheat um, and sometimes you'll see these, these contraptions put around, it almost looks like a sort of trap, but it isn't, it's, it's actually there so that the small birds can get in, including things like partridges and pheasants, but actually uh, it stops deer and badgers getting in because they'll just knock over that tin, get the lid off it and munch the lot. So that's why you'll see some of these surrounded. Also it does help to a certain extent um, for sparrowhawks, if you're feeding around there and a sparrowhawk comes through, you're probably best to stay in there um, and ho hope that the, the, the netting and the wire around it uh, stops the sparrowhawk getting you. So that's probably why you see those. But a lot of um, farmland birds will make use of these hoppers, even though that many of them are actually designed for feeding game birds. Um, and there's all sorts of hoppers put out. Um, and again, you can get paid to do supplementary feeding, mainly spreading it on the ground, but you are allowed to use a few hoppers too. And they can be very successful. Here's a picture I took, um, just some yellow hammers. You can see hard frost. Um, and they know where these hoppers are. And you can build up some really good numbers. And again, farmers are doing this right across our area now, doing the supplementary feeding. So um, I've been mentioning the stewardship scheme. And that is a little package that uh, the government has put together to help farmers. It's voluntary. You don't have to go into it. But rather than just say, oh, pick and choose whatever you like, we know that if you actually choose a couple of hectares, a hectare is about two and a half acres um, in old money. But if you put a couple of hectares in um, of, of wild bird mixture, um, and perhaps you have some weedy stubbles too, or a combination of both, and you also put two or three hectares of summer rich insects um, across 100 hectares of land, and if it's appropriate, you can put skylark plots in and fallow plots for lapwings and stone curlews. We know that if enough farmers do this, then we think we can turn around farmland bird numbers. So the research is there. We don't really need to do any more. We just need to get on and get enough people to do it. Now, the problem here is that you might have one farmer who does all of this. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And the birds on his farm begin to do quite well. But if he's just an oasis in a bit of a desert and all his neighbors aren't doing this, then 
it's never going to work quite as well. We actually need people to do it over a much bigger part of the landscape. So what we did um, is we tried to get farmers to work together on a landscape scale. And we came up with this idea of forming farmer clusters. Um, and that's really where we get farmers um, over an area to work together, not just for farm and birds, this is actually to try and improve everything, soil quality, water quality, uh, and biodiversity in general. So, you know, this could be working for butterflies and brown hares and harvest mice and anything that you're going to get on the farm. But also quality of, of soil and water is really important, looking after our streams. Um, so getting them together and people said, oh, farmers won't work together. But actually, we found the opposite. We found that actually they were very happy to come together and they enjoyed the social life side of it, but they also enjoyed being in control so that they could determine what they were going to put on their farms with advice. What species have we got? What do you want us to do? And then they would talk about it and they would organize it themselves to do it. And it's been a great success. It really has. Um, and particularly, I have to say, in this area, um, we had the very first farmer cluster uh, in our area, in the, in the AOMB, um, of any cluster in the, in the country. And uh, Martin Down is the bit here in red. Um, and these three farmer clusters are set up now. We now call them a super cluster. And any of you who saw um, Country Fire last night will have seen um, some of these farmers been interviewed and being talked about and what they're doing. Um, and it's really been a great success. And farmers really enjoy um, this getting together and sorting it out. And you can see we've completely surrounded Martin Down. Um, and that is important for many reasons because this is a little oasis, if you like. Uh, lots of recording going on, lots of species there. And people used to look at the farmland around it and go, oh, it's just a desert, nothing's happening there. Whereas actually there was a lot happening there and there's even more happening now because of the farmer cluster. And records are piling in and actually the whole of that area now is beginning to thrive with wildlife. We're really increasing butterfly numbers, farmland bird are going up um, and it's all been a real success. But perhaps one of their flagships flagship species um, is this turtle dove. Now Martin Down still has turtle doves on it and if I had to pick one farmland bird that I think is in real trouble it would be this one. Um, I honestly do think I'm, I'm quite confident that we can turn around all the other species that I showed you at the beginning that are declining. This species however is causing problems. First of all it's a migrant so it's just turning up now they don't really turn up until May time. Um, and it, it, it overwinters in West Africa, so down around the Gambia and that sort of area. Um, and then of course, it, so it has to migrate across the Sahara and then get back to our shores. And when it gets back here, well, first of all, it's got to go through France and Spain where they quite like to shoot them, which doesn't help. Um, but having got back here, um, we also think that there used to be two brooded and now they only have one single brood. And we think it's because there's not enough food at this time of the year. Um, in, in that sort of May time period. And after migration, they've lost a lot of weight and they need to build up their body weight again. So um, we've been feeding them, supplementary feeding them. And not only supplementary feeding them, if we're going to give them all this seed on the floor, they will come and find that, that's great. But if you eat a lot of seed, you need to be able to drink. And one of the problems in our area is that apart from our lovely little chalk streams that we have, a lot of the landscape is very dry. So we've been building these little dry, little um, dew ponds, if you want to call them that, small ponds dotted across the landscape so that these birds can come and land and have a drink. And we think that's quite important for them. Um, and so we know that the birds are breeding on Martin Down, but they don't feed there. They tend to go off onto the farm and around to find, to forage for weed seeds and other things. So all of these farmers are actually working together to try and improve the lot for the turtle dove. So it's really very exciting watch this space and we'll see if it works. The other thing that these farmers want to do is they want, they realise that they haven't engaged with the public very well. And I think they all hold their hands up and say, look, you know, it, it's difficult. We don't um, have time. There's not many people working on farms now. They're all flat out, very busy people. But engaging with the public is something that they all want to embrace and do more. So they will be holding more open days. They will be holding um, different times to show you the things that they've been doing. Um, this is a little pond near Tisbury with a group of people coming out and looking around the farm to be shown, you know, what's happening, what's been happening on, on, on the farm. 
Uh, and that will, I think there's going to be a lot more of that happening. So again, we will advertise it within the AOMB. So watch this space because it's it's great to be able to go out on farms, talk to farmers, and actually find out what's happening um, firsthand. Um, the things you can do if you're walking out in the country, go out there because, gosh, we live in a beautiful part of the world. We are so, so lucky. So get out there and walk and go and look um, and look at the wildlife that we've got. Look at the farm and birds that the farmers are working hard to encourage. But heed, the, heed this sign. You know, you are welcome, but try and stick to the footpaths um, and also try and keep your dog under control. And that probably means on the lead, especially at this time of year. I've talked about those ground nesting birds. Um, and, you know, people say to me sometimes, oh, yes, you know, he's my little spaniel, George. He's, he's only enjoying himself and he's two fields away and yapping and rushing around and there's hairs flying everywhere and leverets pouring out and lapwings flying around. And, you know, it, it really isn't good uh, because apart from anything else, predators know that when things are disturbed, it's a real giveaway as to where nests are and they'll be watching. So try and enjoy the countryside, but be responsible. Um, the other thing to do is, is to record what you find. Um, I think farmland generally is very under-recorded. Now, I, listen, I'm not promoting this in particular. There's living record, there's eye record, there's all sorts of apps out there. But the thing is that if you go out and you see lapwings or you see a brown hare, record it. Um, because farmland, if you look at farmland, very often it doesn't have many records. That's been put right in the farmer clusters now. The farmers are all recording their own species. The reason I put iRecord up is it, it's quite a simple one because you have an app and you can have it on your phone and you can literally just record the species there and then and it, it plots where you are and it's a very simple system to use. So that's something that you can certainly do to help and feedback and that will help farmers realize what they've got too. So that's a quick run through. Um, and I now would be very happy to answer any questions if uh, you've got any. Thank you to Peter Thompson for presenting this talk as part of the Spring Talk series hosted by the Chase and Chalk Landscape Partnership Scheme. Thank you to our partners and funders for this talk. The Chase and Chalk Landscape Partnership is a group of organizations working together to protect and enhance the special landscape of Cranbourne Chase and the Chalk Valley. With Cranbourne Chase AONB as the lead partner, and with support from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, this five-year partnership is working with local communities to better connect people with the landscape. For more information, please visit www.cranbournechase.org.uk.